नमस्कार
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on treatment of mild to moderate patients and guest presentation by Department of Health and Family Welfare, Government of Odisha. This is arranged as per requirement of our first line doctors who are attached to COVID care centers and different private setups who need to know the approach of symptoms of how to test these patients and how to go about the first line medicines and the most important is when to refer these people to the right place that's a dedicated covid hospital center or dedicated covid hospital we have two topics the first one is the detection workup treatment and a referral of mild to moderate COVID-19 patients, which I'll be speaking. This is as per the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India guideline, endorsed by Government of Odisha, Professor CBK Mohanty, DMT, and Department of Health and Family Welfare. And followed by that, we'll have a real life case presentation by Dr. Shampad Das, who is in charge of the COVID hospital uh, at Katak, Paswini COVID hospital. And uh, he'll also tell you regarding stratification of mild, moderate, severe symptoms and how you can start uh, approaching a patient from first line drugs and when to monitor and detect somebody is sick so that you can send the patient to the right place at right time. I uh, thank uh, the Department of Health and Family Welfare for a series of webinars in the uh, crisis time to uh, empower our doctors, paramedical workers in the COVID management and uh, our uh, team lead, uh, Madam Anuga and uh, Sri Gupinder Punya uh, uh, always encouraged us to do that. I thank our uh, honorable uh, um, uh, ACS sir, Mahapatra, who has been encouraging us for these activities all the time. And uh, I also thank our uh, um, CNC commissioner, Madam uh, Ananya Dash, who is also uh, uh, there today connected with us, will be speaking to you. And uh, Dr. Deepak, who is the WHO representative at Odisha. And I also welcome all of you who are at different capacity uh, rendering service to the patients. Our sole purpose is there should not be any doubt in your mind that who is the case in this pandemic time, how to go about, how to test them, what are the drugs can be given, when, when to detect alarming symptoms and where to send them, which were discussed earlier and from time to time, there are some changes in the uh, approach in the uh, modality, in the uh, guideline, addition of new things, which will uh, refresh today. Uh, Professor Sivike Mohanty, who had been to uh, SLN Medical College, Koraput, for inauguration of a plasma bank yesterday in his way back from Koraput. So he has sent all his good wishes for the program and uh, asked to go ahead. So uh, to start with, I request uh, Madam Ananya Dash, our Commissioner of CMC, who has been working day and night in this pandemic crisis uh, for the last six months, we have been watching and uh, she is fighting every problem at Katak and around to make everyone secure. And she has uh, done a couple of uh, webinars earlier in uh, mental health from SCB Medical College and taken care of all who are uh, working in the uh, field uh, to fight out Corona. So today it's with this purpose of training our uh, first line doctors in uh, approaching a mild to moderate patient to uh, know how they'll establish the diagnosis, how they start the treatment and how they monitor this patient and how they'll refer the patient to the right place in right time. We uh, have this webinar. And uh, I request uh, uh, Madam Ananya Kash to give a short introduction 
uh, before we go to the uh, agenda proper. Madam is getting connected. Uh, by that time, I request Dr. Deepak to uh, give the background of this program so that by the time Madam connected, we can take it further. Dr. Deepak. Uh, sir, good afternoon, Jan, sir, and all the participants. It has been a long time that we had uh, connected earlier. But I uh, have to say that I have started COVID care center. Start I hope I am audible. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a big COVID care center I may start follow there uh, we have in Patak we have got COVID care centers and we have got de dedicated COVID health and, uh, uh, hospitals too. So a training re Sarjo Kathoda Koiwe or Joe Sampo, Dr. Sampo Joe Insura Koiwe, please uh, uh, listen to it attentively. Uh, Madam Asiya Bartwan, because of network issues, this is connection to issues of Chief, what I can say but uh, the issues is ki uh, doubt please get clarified once you we finish the this uh, teleconversation tapar jodi time achi tik time re you write your doubts ame katha haba and you have got the best teachers here on this platform now ya pore tu apan kebe au ette bhalo teachers milibeni you have got the best teachers now in the zoom training jaha doubt achi you keep on asking uh, write on a paper and after this session, we will ask uh, our uh, my teachers and also your teachers to uh, clarify on the doubts. Okay. So once uh, Madam Commissioner is online, so we will uh, hear from her. Okay. As of now, she is not here. Uh, so till then, I will request ki, uh, request to ki join us. So start from the So that uh, Madam online is available. I will give you line of introduction. Then we will continue. Sir. Fine, Dr. Deepak, and uh, uh, a little more background. Uh, our panel uh, is already connected. We have uh, Professor Amar Patnaik, who is the head of pulmonary medicine and the nodal officer for COVID-19. Uh, he'll be joining in half an hour time here. Professor Nivita Pani, who is uh, head of training at SCV Medical College, is already connected online. And uh, Dr. P.K. Thatoi, uh, who is one of the resource portions in the training from beginning he is also connected online because of the covid scare you know everyone uh, prefers to get connected online uh, uh, professor pani are you there professor nivita pani professor nivita pani are you there Madam will be, uh, Professor Pani has joined. She'll be uh, um, taking your queries at the end. Uh, so Jant? Jant? Yes, yes, you have un unmuted. Okay, I'm uh, here only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam, um, uh, Ananya, Madam has joined and uh, we are starting the program. So, would you like to say a few words to the uh, trainees? Yes, thank you, Dr. Panda. It is a very novel uh, step which we have taken today by organizing this uh, training because uh, uh, we know that the focus of the government is to reduce fatalities. One of our focus again and again has been to reduce fatalities. And if we are to reduce fatalities, we have to understand how to uh, best do symptom management in our CCCs and our COVID hospitals. Uh, Ashwini has uh, led the way throughout uh, since the beginning in treating uh, so many patients from across the coastal area especially. I would like to thank them for that. And I would also hope that their expertise, which has been developed over time, helps other CCCs and COVID hospitals because we can only do better in this pandemic by sharing as much information as we have. It is an evolving situation. Uh, in the beginning, we did not have any specific drugs to treat them with. Then we started with remdesivir. Then uh, maybe in the future, some. Uh, then we started with plasma therapy. So it's an evolving situation. We have all learned through the entire process. So um, one aspect would be, which uh, you would obviously be focusing on, will be the symptom management. 
another uh, aspect of uh, managing cases uh, has been the panic management among uh, the different cases because uh, in many cases we have seen that the patients are complaining of breathlessness they are complaining of uh, um, shortness of breath but uh, when we check it is seen that uh, the oxygen saturation is quite stable so the psychological aspect of the patients how to calm them how to uh, manage it in a stressful environment i think uh, if you talk about that also uh, our uh, uh, friends who are uh, joined from different cccs they'll also find it useful further another uh, doubt which uh, i think many of our uh, uh, doctors and staff in cccs have is uh, when to shift the patient because uh, i am a layman i'm just telling you from the observations which uh, i have uh, seen over the last few months often the questions are asked that when should a patient be shifted so if uh, certain guidelines can be given in that regard that uh, when do we shift a patient from home isolation to ccc and when do we shift the patient from uh, ccc to uh, ch in more specific terms then i think we can also uh, do better also uh, there are some critical and uh, peculiar cases which we re- uh, which we receive where the primary comorbidity is something else and the covid uh, related symptoms are lesser so how to manage those cases where the associated comorbidity has to be managed along with and probably even better than the covid comorbidity so uh, these are uh, some uh, points i think uh, which can be uh, dwelled upon also i would like to thank all the doctors who have been uh, serving continuously in our cccs uh, i hope that you are taking rounds regularly because uh, uh, even though the patient may be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic once he, sh- he or she is shifted to a government ccc they expect a certain level of care so uh, regularly three or four rounds must be taken i know that in many cases the nodal officers have themselves uh, taken a lot of interest but uh, as the treating doctors the adopters the healing touch is what people want even though it may not be required clinically it is required psychologically so i would request all of you to ensure that that is not compromised upon uh, so i would uh, also request you that any questions which you have may be asked at this platform so that uh, they are dealt with uh, at this level itself and uh, please feel free to make it an interactive session rather than a one sided monologue that would be my request and i again uh, thank you for your service thank you thank you ma'am for that uh, uh, nice introduction uh, rightly you have pointed out that we need to uh, inform all our first line doctors that uh, what all they need to do and uh, the more important thing they must go to the patient and say hello it may happen that they are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic they may not need any treatment but it's important to go and say them hello what is the problem and anything uh, unrelated to covid is also there they may ask uh, they may that may be a comorbidity that may be a long existing uh, problem for the patient but uh, that can be ensured and as, as rightly you have pointed out the science is evolving and last 5 months we have seen how many drugs have come into picture and how many have gone away so uh, many are confused regarding by the time they accept some modality of treatment that is no more there that that goes away so uh, it it requires continuous discussion and we have been at scb medical college we have been training the doctors of different covid hospitals and also district headquarter hospitals and the uh, dedicated covid uh, hospital centers Uh, around the uh, last 5 6 months and uh, there has been a lot of positive benefit those who are there with us they attended the hands on program and every week we conduct two webinars uh, like this and uh, the many people have joined and uh, if required this also we can repeat in different topics and i'll send you the link uh, which is uh, there uh, for other webinars our ayush doctors or the junior doctors attending the covid care centers also can join and can up, updated on different upcoming topics like hematological complication cardiac complications the renal complications their pulmonary complications and also the evolving therapies like antivirals like plasma therapy like steroids like uh, the different um, nutrients so we keep on discussing on different topic from time to time will give that benefit will make them a part today i see uh, almost uh, 
60, 70 doctors have joined. So uh, regularly, they, if they are free, they can come and uh, participate. And we have a panel, as you have rightly mentioned, we have a panel, uh, including Professor M.R. Potnaik, Professor Nivita Pani, Dr. P.K. Thatui, uh, myself, who have already joined online and will be coming here. And uh, it, it should be interactive one. So please type your questions in the chat box. Or if you want to ask during the open forum, you can unmute and ask. We have a long one hour of interaction. Dr. Shampad is academically very good. You know, uh, he's doing a good job in managing patients and as well as he has done a good data keeping of the patient and last webinars he has presented very well all the experiences from Ashwini Hospital. So he will uh, also share his experience regarding the real life case. And at the end, we will take up any topic coming to this issues of detection, workup, treatment, referral, or any uh, related issue you are facing in the day to day in hospital practice. So without much delay, thanking uh, Madam Ananya Dash, our commissioner, uh, CMC, for this uh, noble uh, proposal. And I know she is very interested. She came to SCB Mental Health Institute and uh, did programs for the mental health of the people also. And uh, she takes uh, this aesthetic part also. And I thank Dr. Deepak, who is working day and night. And really, uh, the job he is doing is commendable. And uh, with this, uh, thanking everyone, uh, panels and the delegates who have joined, uh, will be uh, starting the uh, proceedings. So first topic is about detection, workup, treatment and the referral, which I'll be uh, covering and followed by uh, the case presentation and the case-based discussion on the management by Dr. Shampad Das. So uh, I request our team to uh, share this slide and we'll go to the first topic immediately. Professor Niveta Pani is there, connected. Fine. Madam will be, uh, Madam is there, she'll be coming during the panel of uh, discussions. So, uh, you know, the pandemic is on. And daily, for last uh, five to six months, daily we listen, the uh, case number has become this. The case number has become that, and uh, the death number has become this, and the death number has become that. And we we, we see that this has uh, topped the list. Now uh, America, now Brazil, now India. Now this is the uh, complications when Kawasaki comes into picture, when the uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation comes into picture, when uh, we know more about the pulmonary manifestations, the cardiac, renal, and ultimately the multi-organ involvement is coming up. Where is the vaccine and what is the attempt and daily. And everything revolves around uh, the virus only. And this is the pandemic, which is on for the last five to six months. So today we'll see the clinical case management, which is uh, uh, approved by the uh, central government and the state government. And before I go to the topic, I tell that the whole world is burning and the uh, numbers are uh, again for you. The world number is approaching 2.5 crores and world death is uh, almost uh, 8.5 lakhs. So in the country, uh, we are approaching almost 34 lakh patients with uh, around 62,000 deaths in the state. Uh, by the end of August, it may be one lakh case for us, with death may uh, reach around uh, 500. So uh, this is uh, the casualties, the load, but another important part, which many of us forget to see, as uh, Ananya Ma'am told, uh, that a lot of stress in the mind of the people. We receive day calls day in and day out. Uh, people are panic. But you see, out of this 95 thousand cases, the 65,000 have already recovered. So we have just around 30,000 active cases in the state and they all recovered are doing well. Uh, they're not on follow up and uh, they have taken uh, the good news to the society. And uh, in our next 40, uh, 30 minutes time, 
uh, I'll be telling you about presumed pathophysiology, which is very important to understand the disease, the clinical presentations, the radiological findings, the treatment protocol, oxygen therapy, immunotherapy, and ICU indications. And uh, be a lot, uh, wherever required, I'll stress upon and uh, post your questions uh, in the chat box, we can, which you can uh, take with our panel. The pathophysiology, you know, it's uh, not only the pneumocyte which is affected. You can see here, the spike proteins are mostly determine the pathophysiology or the pathogenicity of the virus, and they are different in different strains. We have found around 73 strains in the country, and around 20 strains in the state uh, so far, and the virus binds to the heme part of the hemoglobin. There are plus hemolysis, there are plus hypoxia, acute kidney injury, myocarditis, encephalopathy, and uh, there are two phases in this virus. The phase one is the virus itself, phase two, the body's reaction towards the virus. What happens in phase one? The virus goes and invades different organs and causes symptoms. What you get, fever, cough, breathlessness, nasal congestion, and symptoms related, the hypoxia, which you tell silent hypoxia, because otherwise the patient is stable, seating, and the saturation goes down. So we tell it a happy hypoxia or silent hypoxia. And these all start because of the virus. And gradually what happens, the viral uh, virus effect ameliorates and the body effect takes over. So there are, of course, inflammatory response. There are, of course, cytokine surge. The interleukin goes up. The CRP goes up. The LDH goes up. The ferritin goes up. The procalcitonin comes down. The D-dimer goes up. And there are, of course, a lot of problems in different organs. The coagulopathy, the myocarditis, the uh, pulmonary edema, the encephalopathy, the renal failure, and, and, and series of complications affecting the multi-organ failure. And here, I'll tell one thing to you. More than the virus causes the damage, the body damages itself by its very aggravated reaction towards virus. So if you are immunocompetent, you can think that virus will not do anything to me. But if your body once starts reacting to the virus, it may happen that the uh, situation becomes worse than what all virus caused damage to us. So in one hand, immunocompetent people are protected. They don't go to phase two, phase three, phase four, or the disease that's the pneumonia phase, that the cytokine storm, because they are immunocompetent. In the other hand, if the immune system once reacts to the virus, you see many people in the transportation, they die. Even young people, they have died. And even uh, they deteriorate very fast, the saturation comes down. We get phone call. Our saturation is 38%. 45% patient is otherwise normal. There is no asthma, no uh, infirmity. So uh, there is a lot of challenge in the pathophysiology also. And what I have shown you here is the uh, mild infection and severe infection. You see the effector cells, the macrophages, and how they react. The, the, the mild infection, usually they come to the site and there are less viremia. And severe infection, this uh, goes to the circulation. There are because the Lymphopenia and the cytokine surge takes place. There are because fibrin mesh activated platelets and there are because DIC. And with this DIC, there are because clot in all the arteries around, starting from the lung to the different organ. You can see heart, kidney, liver, and then and severe infection with a high viral load. Then uh, the patient deteriorates with the cytokine uh, storm, which is there uh, uh, in the end. And here is a hand uh, written diagram of the uh, pathophysiology because you know it's a new virus. Uh, no much has come to textbooks. You can see through fecal oral route also there can be transmission and also through the cough or respiratory droplets. There occurs multi organ failure, multi system organ failure, decreased perfusion and the blood volume, and uh, the blood pressure also falls in patient goes to systemic inflammatory response syndrome of the SOX. And the type 2 pneumocyte, this is a picture of type 2 pneumocyte where the interleukin 1, the TNF alpha, the interleukin 6, the macrophage all uh, are activated, and there are, of course, the vasodilatation increase in permeability and it uh, affects the brain causing fever, 
hyperparexia it, it increases the work of breathing because there are course, fluid and edema also you ct scan and the ultrasound of the pulmonary edema and uh, this viruses this is the uh, nemocyte the type 2 nemocyte where the virus enters this is the as2 enzyme it is a very common uh, molecule of ours the angiotensin converting enzyme Do you know it's the first target in the control of uh, blood pressure we use arbs uh, we use the as inhibitors uh, to control the blood pressure and this as uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme is the culprit which attaches the virus with the cell this is the receptor as to receptor and there the virus comes here and viral proteins are there and viral virus replicates so the basic pathophysiology you know like every organism they want to grow and they want to grow in the human body once they have entered through the respiration or once they have entered uh, through the fecal oral route they come uh, to the target organ and cause a cytokine surge and they replicate inside a nemocyte in a inside a long cell uh, the, the the translocation takes place and you know it's a rna virus the protease comes there are viral proteins and multiple virus are released and the viral number goes up so this is how the pathophysiology uh, is there with this background we'll see the uh, disease you know different types of pneumonia is seen the l type and s type is the initial description and the patients have different strains and what people present at uh, bhuvaneshwar or at katak is not same what people present as uh, barampur or uh, ganjam that uh, all of us know there is different strains present differently and there are of course lot of uh, difference in the clinical features in the outcome in the severity in the cytokine storm in this patient this is basing on the enzyme elastins the l type and s type are divided and these are the group where there is low uh, vq ratio low long weight and low long recruitability so uh, with this i'll go to clinical presentation and you know the uh, case definition includes the individual who has a travel history initially it was international travel but it became the uh, local travel as well now uh, traveling to these different states like when uh, west bengal was hot spot and then became uh, even uh, inside the state when ganjam was hot spot so a suspicious travel history is important coming in contact of a laboratory confirmed case is important the symptomatic healthcare personnel are taken as a special high risk age group and all the hospitalized patient are screened for the severe acute respiratory illness symptoms that is fever cough and shortness of breath asymptomatic direct and high risk contact of a confirmed patient are also screened and symptoms means fever cough and shortness of breath direct and high risk contacts include those who live in the same household with a confirmed case and the healthcare personnel who examined a confirmed case so this is a very simple case definition but we must remember unless a person is a laboratory confirmed covid-19 infection irrespective of the clinical signs and symptoms irrespective of the travel history and the contact history you cannot brand him as a case of covid-19 so the laboratory confirmation is must and you know now we have three types of tests we are doing a rapid antigen test we are doing a true nat uh, or cb nat test and we are doing a rt pcr test the most sensitive test is a rt pcr test that is also close type open type and uh, in the rapid antigen test if somebody has come positive it is positive because it's a very specific test but it's not sensitive it may happen you can miss some positive cases so if you have strong suspicion you have to repeat rt pcr even if the patient is uh, negative for rapid antigen test true not cbnat also same uh, we just screen and if comes positive uh, here if it comes positive we repeat with the rt pcr and declare the patient positive the, testing has gone up in the state now we are doing 60000 plus tests and on days it is reaching up to 70000 and and you'll be happy to know almost 2 lakh tests has been completed and the country has uh, completed almost 3 crore tests this tells how uh, sincerely the people are working collecting a nasal swab doing it antigen test and rt pcr test is not very convenient but our people for the collection or uh, healthcare team and also all the people in different centers to test are committed uh, in this purpose 
So coming to the topic, the case can be a mild case, can be a moderate case, can be a severe case. This is the basic of the approach. You know, the mild and very mild cases, they may be asymptomatic also. Many people, they don't have any symptom. And many people, they just get out of screening. That we see now, the local contacts of a positive patient. They may not be symptomatic also, but sometimes it may appear and go away. Symptom means there may be uh, mild malaise, there may be a uh, little nasal congestion, and few people have loss of taste, loss of smell. That is what we come across very severely. And those who have continued fever, hypoxia, vertigo, uh, blackout, uh, headache, they are taken as uh, mild to moderate symptoms and they are screened for the situation. Then uh, moderate cases, if a mild case is admitted and he is developing these features, a loss of blood pressure, when the blood pressure comes down, the systolic comes below 100, a patient who is having uh, hypoxia, the saturation falls below 95%, uh, or a patient who is having headache, high grade fever 100 to 103, patient has vomiting and different related features, we know that the patient is going to moderate stage. And any time the patient is having encephalopathy, mental confusion, the uh, urinary output has come down and uh, the patient becomes uh, very incoherent with features of multi-organ failure, which the patient has become uh, severe. And I'll, I'll show you the categorization also. And mild patients are sent to the COVID care centers, which many of you uh, are at test and working. The moderate patients are preferably sent to dedicated COVID health centers and sick patients go to dedicated COVID hospital. Oswini is a dedicated COVID hospital. And suspect and confirmed cases should not be allowed to mix under any uh, circumstances. And all these facilities will follow strict infection prevention control practices. So I have kept a slide of IPC at the end for you all, because what we observe at SCB Medical College, City Hospital, Cancer Institute, and Sisu Bhavan, that even doctors and healthcare workers are not very serious about inf infection control practices. That's why the hospitals have started giving uh, many patients of late. So this is just for your uh, knowledge that the mild and very mild cases in CCC, what you all come across, cases with fever and upper respiratory tract illness, with the, where the patient will be accommodated in dedicated COVID care centers, and the patient will be tested COVID-19 until that time they remain in the suspected care section. So every CCC has a suspected care section and a confirmed case section. And the patient tested positive will be moved to the confirmed case section. If tests are negative, the patient will be given symptomatic treatment and discharged with uh, prescribed medications for non-COVID causes. And any patient qualifies as moderate or severe will be shifted to dedicated higher COVID hospital centers or hospital. Here, one thing I'll tell about home isolation, uh, what Ananya ma'am has already pointed out. After the cases number has increased and after it was found that majority of the patients are mildly symptomatic and asymptomatic, and it's very inconvenient for them to go to a COVID care center or dedicated uh, COVID hospital center, they can be managed very well. Up to 95% of patients can be managed very well at their home setup, provided they have a washroom separate, which others will not use. They have somebody to attend them, will give them food, water at their place, and they'll be limited to one room only with a washroom where they'll stay. A kit will be given, a COVID care kit will be given uh, uh, to them, where, which will contain the instruction of what all they have to do, how they have to wear the mask, how they have to do a hand wash, and what daily they have to measure, like the blood pressure, like the temperature, like the oxygen saturation. Now, every home contains appliances. Every home contains a, an Android uh, BP instrument, a digital uh, thermometer, a pulse oximeter, which can be used to know their parameters in the morning and evening. And once they have tachycardia, they have tachypnea, the, uh, the respiratory rate is more than 24, the, the heart rate is more than 110, the saturation falls below 95, 
or uh, the blood pressure falls below 100 millimeters systolic you have to know that the patient is sinking or if there is high grade fever patient is mentally incoherent the urination has come down you can know the patient is sinking and requires the immediately patient has to be shifted so not only from this covid care center from the home isolation also patient need to be sent shifted to the dedicated covid hospital center and dedicated covid hospital so uh, the what is a dedicated uh, COVID, uh, this is the, uh, the mild and uh, very mild cases, and this is the COVID care center, the group one category of cases which I uh, told you, uh, clinically mild, very mild and suspect cases, and the facilities can be shut up in the hostels, hotels, schools, stadiums, lodges, which all of you see, uh, we have taken our indoor stadium, we have taken OCA, and then many centers like Dreams have been taken functions in the hospitals at the last resort. Usually as CCC, we don't take hospitals. Hospitals are designated hospital centers or COVID hospitals. Separate areas for suspect and confirmed cases are mandatory. Attempt to be made to provide individual rooms for suspect cases that we try, but every facility may not have that. Every such facility must be mapped to one or more dedicated COVID hospital centers or dedicated COVID hospitals. Immediately, the patient can be transferred if they're sick. And the same facility is extended to home isolation now that has been aided and the basic life support ambulance with sufficient oxygen support is to be available so that anybody who is having hypoxia immediately with oxygen, you can shift to the nearest dedicated COVID hospital center or dedicated COVID hospital. The human resources may be roped in from IOS doctors, training protocols and the trend protocols are given to them like this and they work. This is the DCHC where uh, pneumonia with no sign of severe disease uh, uh, can be taken to. You know, in a routine x-ray, in a routine CT scan, you may get a viral pneumonia. And the, uh, there are classical pictures of Corrad 1, Corrad 2, Corrad 3, Corrad 4, Corrad 5, which are classical radiological pictures of COVID-19. And of late, we know, even if the test is negative, we are doing an X-ray, we are doing a CT scan. And if it is suspicious, we are repeating the test. But test has to be positive to tell you as a case. And these patients with uh, uh, features of pneumonia are moderate cases. And usually, they have a saturation less than 95%. The cases with above symptom referred directly to the uh, dedicated COVID uh, health centers. And usually doctors, allopathic doctors are in charge. They assess the severity and till test results are declared, the suspect cases will be kept in suspect case and the uh, confirmed cases in the confirmed case section. Patient test negative as usual will be treated for the non-COVID reason and any patient qualifies as severe case will be shifted to the uh, dedicated COVID hospital. Like I told you, the Oshini hospital is a dedicated COVID hospital. So here, for cases who are moderate, full hospital or a block of hospital can be converted to uh, DCSC. The private hospital also can be designated, which you see of late, we have taken Shadguru, we have taken Ashwini, we have taken uh, the Tata COVID hospital in the Barampur, we have taken Sham, taken Teams. The hospital will have separate areas for suspect and confirmed cases. The hospital to have beds with assured oxygen support. The oxygen support will be there at the CCC also, but most importantly, the COVID dedicated COVID hospital center is important because anybody who comes is in need of oxygen. Every such facility to be mapped with one or more dedicated COVID hospital and anybody who is deteriorating here will be immediately sent to the dedicated COVID hospital. So basic life support ambulance with sufficient oxygen will be available for these people. Then a line about the dedicated COVID hospital. Severe pneumonia, but the respiratory rate is more than 30. The saturation is less than 90% and the air DS or septic shock. The patient has blood pressure, which is low. The mean arterial pressure is less than 65 and the lactate is more than two. That will show in a slide. So patient has gone to shock. Patient has uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome or breath dyspneic where the, uh, the respiratory rate is high and saturation is falling and cases with above symptoms to be referred directly and admitted in the dedicated COVID hospital. If you come across such a patient, don't waste time at the CCC or the CSC. Directly should come to DCH so that life can be shaped. And you listen to uh, 
uh, Dr. Shampath, they have taken many such patients from different uh, DCSC and CCC, and their uh, sincere effort has given back the life to them. And the patient tested positive will remain in ICU and receive treatment as per the standard treatment protocol, which Dr. Shampath will speak to you. So these are for severe cases. Full hospital or a separate block in the hospital. Private hospital also can be designated and hospitals have ICUs, ventilators and beds with oxygen. And hospitals which have separate areas for suspect and confirmed cases and facilities uh, are referral centers for CCCs and DCSs. They are roped to these centers. So this is uh, in a single chart, it shows how a case comes, uh, uh, how you suspect it's a mild or moderate or severe. Then you admit to the COVID care center, dedicated COVID hospital center or dedicated COVID hospital, then testing and negative uh, the, uh, the isolation uh, patients and the positive patients are uh, kept separately. And you know this uh, mild and the moderate patients after 10 days, they are discharged even without a test. And, uh, here, the severe patient are to be kept uh, uh, till the symptoms subside. Here, if they're asymptomatic, they can be left on day 10. Here, they'll be kept till the symptoms subside. And most importantly, they have to be tested once before discharge. So this is the algorithm for the isolation of cases. Here, one thing I laid, this mild and very mild patients, not moderate, not a patient who is diabetic, hypertensive, heart disease, malignancy, or pregnancy, not child. Those who are very chef, young people, uh, no symptoms or mild symptoms, they can be allowed for home isolation and they have to give an undertaking regarding the home isolation. There'll be uh, a contact person, there'll be mobile number, the home will be labeled uh, about a home isolation patient stay, staying there. There will be uh, labeling of the patient, there will be a stamping of the patient, and the patient will use separate washroom, separate room, and the home uh, members of the caregivers will take care of the patient. And any alarming symptom, the patient can be referred uh, to the CCC or the CSC or the COVID hospital. So this is what has successfully been implemented. And now we have around 50% plus patients around 52% of patients in home isolation, which uh, the government is planning to enhance further. We are planning to enhance up to 80% of patients in home isolation, accepting this comorbidity, accepting the elderly people, obese people, pregnancy, and the small children. Up to 80% patient can be allowed who will not require any hospital support. And these people can be admitted. And as ma'am has already pointed out, we have to focus that how we can save every life or uh, uh, beloved chief minister has uh, reinforced that that's why so many plasma banks that's why so many medicines that's why so many education programs and each life is valuable and we have to shave each life here we have come to uh, the end of the stratification i'll tell you something uh, regarding the symptom you can see uh, the people who go to these symptoms of temperature, either more than 38 degrees centigrade or less than 36 degrees centigrade, heart rate more than 90, respiratory rate more than 20, or the uh, partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide less than 32, the TLC more than 12,000 or less than 4,000, the, uh, the leukopenia is also a risk factor and more than 10% immature bands are classified as a SIRS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And you know, once the patient goes to this state, we know that the cytokine storm has resulted and we try to shift him to the ICU or a, a dedicated COVID hospital as soon as possible. So uh, remember, it doesn't affect lungs only. It affects brain, cardiovascular system, renal, liver, GI, hematologic, and causes lactic acidosis as well. Also, a few interesting x-rays. This is an x-ray from a patient, initial patient I'm talking four or five months back. Uh, Dr. Ashwini will tell you, a patient come, Dr. Sampath will tell you in the Ashwini hospital, uh, the day one and day four pictures, you can see how uh, treatment has changed. And this patient uh, has recovered, ultimately a, a real life patient. This is an x-ray from Ames, Bhubaneswar where there is evidence of viral pneumonia. And you can see that this is the classical picture. If you do an X-ray and see this picture, the, the, the pneumonia is peripherally sitting. You can see pneumonia is peripherally sitting, pneumonia is peripherally sitting. And uh, here also you can see the, 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 the central part is spared and the peripheral part is there. So such a picture tells about the viral pneumonia 
and uh, this is a CT scan. Here also you can see the lesion uh, which is peripherally placed and both the consolidation as well as the uh, intravascular coagulation, the coagulopathy contributes to such a uh, radiological shadow. And there's a series of X-rays. You can see the picture of the patients in the different ICUs. And uh, in the CT scan, you see there is a lot, lot of exudation. There's the fluid ac accumulation in the lungs. And uh, this is the ultrasound, which uh, shows this uh, congestion, the fluid ac accumulation. And uh, this uh, is how a viral pneumonia behaves, a pulmonary edema behaves, a SIRS behaves. And you see in the posterior gutter, this is the vertebra, this is the mediastinum, and you see this uh, uh, consolidation pictures in the patients. So uh, this is also uh, regarding the uh, different uh, name causes of pneumonia. And if you get such X-ray picture, scan picture, even if the test comes negative, they, they are highly suspicious and you have to test them again to confirm the diagnosis. Now I'll tell you something regarding treatment protocol. Many are confused regarding treatment, what we are giving and why we are giving. You see, a patient has come and uh, you have to give some supportive medication at the beginning. It is true that mild to mild patients or asymptomatic patient, they don't require much treatment. But as per our ICMR guideline, we start with a hydroxychloroquine azithromycin regimen or a ivermectin doxycycline regimen. Being uh, cardiotoxic, this combination had uh, created an alarm. I'll tell you in detail. And uh, the ivermectin doxycycline also good initially as uh, antibiotics with antiviral effects. And vitamin C, zinc are proved to have antiviral effect. And uh, now the old uh, um, antivirals like boosted lopinavir and oseltanavir are gone. We have febipiravir, we have remdesivir with us, which uh, are very um, easily available by government of Odisites. Available free of cost to our patients in COVID hospitals. You know, febipiravir comes 200 milligram, and uh, the dose is nine tablet to start BD and four uh, tablet to BD for five to seven days. Remdesivir comes 200 injection to start and 100 OD to give for seven to 10 days and even 14 days in sick patients. And immunomodulators like toxilizumab and elastin, they have a role. Uh, there are little controversies, but interleukin-6 inhibitors, the monoclonal antibodies against interleukin-6 were being used and uh, we have seen the positive result from a single dose of toxilizumab, which can be repeated after a week. And dexamethasone has replaced methylprednisolone of late, but there are still uh, uh, doctors who still prefer the methylprednisolone and when to start steroid, I'll tell uh, you, I have a slide. And once we knew that the DIC is the problem, the uh, low molecular heparin like anoxaparin, like fondaparin, like deltaparin, they came into picture. And you know about plasma therapy, we uh, give passive immunity, the antibodies to the patient and, 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 and paracetamol when the fever comes. So hydroxychloroquine, you know, uh, 400 milligram uh, twice a day, day one, followed by 400 milligram once uh, weekly as a prophylaxis. And those who are healthcare personals exposed, uh, ICMR recommends them uh, this prophylaxis and therapeutic dose is 400 milligram twice a day, followed by 200 milligram twice a day for five to seven days. Uh, uh, and ICMR is recommended and the US has also uh, recommended and, uh, you know, many countries in the world they're using hydroxychloroquine and this is regarding their mechanism action and uh, the different in vitro effects. The ivermectin, as you know, it has antiviral properties shown to inhibit the viral replications, reduce, reduce the viral RNA in uh, supernat and, 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 and then uh, after 48 hours doesn't have a viral material. So uh, usually the ivermectin is combined with the uh, doxycycline, but uh, all these drugs are off-level drugs. I'm telling you, you tell hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, you tell febipiravir or remdesivir, even a plasma therapy, they're off-level drugs. But in view of the pandemicity, they're allowed because we are having hope that they can work to some extent. Azithromycin, uh, the QT prolongation was the issue with uh, uh, um, the hydroxychloroquine and uh, doxycycline was also a, a picture and in, especially when you get a, a typical pneumonia, this is preferred. And uh, this is a boosted 
lupinavir, ritonavir, and also ritonavir, which was used in the H1N1 also uh, implemented at the beginning. So Oxford University showed that dexamethasone is more effective than the methylprednisolone, and many patients shifted uh, from uh, one steroid to other. The giving of steroid the right time is when the patient develops hypoxia. Once uh, they are occurs hypoxia, the saturation level falls along with the oxygen, you have to start the steroid. Special issues come when a diabetic uh, moves through that and along with the glycemic control, along with the insulin, you have to plan uh, for steroid therapy because steroid really helps in prevention of a cytokine storm at this stage of the disease. You, I told you about the anticoagulation. The, it's, a, it's a prothrombotic state and incidences of thromboembolic phenomena are seen. The pulmonary embolism and the thrombotic events in nervous system are seen and there occurs cytokine stir. So we do a D-dimer, we do a prothrombin time, the APTT, the INR, the platelet, the ferritin, LDH, the CRP and interleukin 6 and the anticoagulation with low molecular heparin and on fractionated heparin takes place. We usually prefer low molecular heparin in patients with good renal result where the kidney clear is more than 30. If kidney tolerance is less than 30, we go for unfractionated heparin to prevent this thromboembolic phenomenon. There is no specific therapy till date, and we just uh, recommend these off level treatments. I'm not going to the details of this. I'll just touch upon the oxygen therapy because you can also start oxygen therapy at your setup. When usually the saturation falls below 95, be careful. And the target uh, partial pressure of the oxygen, 95 to 92 percent, you have to be very careful uh, in starting the oxygen immediately. And the PaO2, uh, if more than 55, and you can give it by nasal cannula mask, venturi mask, or the reservoir mask, or you can give a hypro nasal cannula if the situation is not maintaining, but there may be aerosol generation, you have to be a little careful. Especially the CPAP, BiPAP, the NIV procedures can also be done, but they are also aerosol generating procedures so to protect yourself and your staff at the ICU when somebody is getting NIV. So, starting from uh, 1 liter to 2 liter, 3 liter, 4 liter, up to 4 liter, we can give an oxygen cannula. A face mask can give up to 8 liters, and the oxygen reservoir mask can give up to 15 liters. And the high flow nasal cannula can give still more. And you know, those who don't maintain and we don't want a intubation, we go for high flow uh, nasal cannula in these patients. Immunotherapy, uh, you know, the convalescent plasma is effective, though there are some controversies. It's an off level drug, but we are seeing the patients improving. And the, that's the patient who have recovered, they are uh, called to donate blood and they, have, they are presumed to have antibodies, which helps. And uh, the previous pandemics have also used this convalescent plasma for treatment of the patients. The, the, the tocilizumab have been used and uh, patients have received the immunomodulator. And a few lines about shock, I'll tell you. I've already told you, you maintain a agent. Which agent we prefer? We uh, prefer normally to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 65 milliliter mercury or a serum lactate level more than 2 millimole will confirm the patient is having septic shock. And you know, uh, the shock can be septic, cardiogenic, they can be uh, my myocarditis, and, and, and anything can be the reason. And 1 to 5% of patients, and, and then 20 to 35%, almost one third of the ICU patients, they develop shock. And in management, I have already told you, uh, you have to recognize the infection uh, is there. Usually, the secondary bacterial infection is also not uncommon, confined in the vasopressors needed where the mean arterial pressure is maintained above 65 and uh, lactate is less than 2 millimole per liter uh, in absence of hypovolemia. Be very careful in giving fluid, not more than 30 ml per hour. The isotonic crystalloids uh, like normal saline or ringer lactate uh, is preferred and less than 3 hour. And don't use the hypotonic crystalloid which are hydroxyethyl starch available freely in the market, but don't use these molecules. Avoid volume overload, you know, SIRS is a problem and the ARTS-like picture is a problem. You administer central venous catheter and you can measure uh, central venous pressure uh, in the ICU wherever there is facility. You have to judiciously use the norepinephrine, epinephrine, vasopressin and dopamine. And dopamine has to be reserved specially for the patient 
who has uh, low risk of tachyarrhythmia or bradycardia because uh, it is very common in use of dopamine. And you have to uh, monitor the mean atrial pressure, urine output roughly uh, tells about this and a urine output of 0.5 ml per kg is very important and, 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 and uh, uh, per hour. So uh, the urine output more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour very important the skin modeling consciousness and the lactate are also shared. So management of septic shock includes the therapeutic measure we have to suspect that body's inflammatory response has started and you can start the glucocorticoids in a short period of time maybe three to five days you should not exceed the equivalent of methylprednisolone one to two milligrams per kg per day so high dose of steroid can cause further immunosuppression the patient can deteriorate larger dose of glucocorticoid will delay the removal of coronavirus due to the immunosuppressive effects and early supportive therapy and monitoring is important you have to use the conservative fluid, fluid management patient uh, with sari then there is uh, if there is no evidence of shock if you can give fluid a little slow and patient with sari should be treated cautiously with the IV fluids because aggressive fluid um, ocean the oxygenation especially in settings where there is limited availability of mechanical ventilators for our patient you know many are ventilator requiring patient and ICU are getting full gradually Closely monitor uh, the patients with severe acute respiratory illness, the signs of clinical deterioration, and as rapidly progressive respiratory failure, the part of the disease, sepsis, the uh, applying the supportive care uh, intravenously, uh, intermittently is very important, and, and, and timely, effective, and safe supportive therapies is the cornerstone of the therapy for patients that develop severe manifestation of novel coronavirus. So this uh, comorbid conditions uh, uh, are important, like uh, diabetes, like hypertension, like malignancy, heart disease, renal disease, and due to intensive care management of surgery, we have to determine chronic therapy should be continued, which therapy should be stopped temporarily. So uh, the patient having many diseases, we have to decide which drug is mandatory, like diabetic, we have to mandatory continue the insulin in this patient or the prognosis is very bad. So uh, you have to communicate early with the patient. What happens when doctors, they work, they don't call the patient's attendant and talk. So there occurs the difference of opinion. And they don't understand the policy, the motive of the treatment. So you have to communicate proactively with patients and families, provide uh, the support and pro prognostic information and they understand the patient's values and the preferences regarding life sustaining intervention. So every day, because the ICU patient, a pandemic patient, very sick patient, Every day we have to go for that. And those who developed high respiratory rate, labored breathing, require oxygen, low blood pressure, altered mentation, or other organ failure like renal uh, injury, hepatic injury, coagulopathy, blindly we send them to the uh, COVID hospital or dedicated COVID hospital center. Don't keep in home isolation, don't keep in the COVID care center. So uh, this is an absolute indication for hospitalization when there is tachypnea, respiratory rate is more than 24, oxygen saturation is less than 94, sign of hypotension, low blood pressure and altered mentation, risk of severe disease that raises more than 60, diabetic, hypertensive and immunocompromised, the chronic, long, cardiac, renal and hepatic diseases, they uh, shed in. Unique feature in this Disease is cytokine storm. I've already told you, flooding of the lungs with bilateral peripheral opacities takes place. Lung becomes necrotic. We have seen in the autopsy. There occurs profound vascular dilatation and leukopenia. I've already showed the leukopenia is a bad prognostic marker. Leukopenia is very specific to COVID. High ferritin and the CRP levels are bad prognostic marker. High D dimer tells that patient has to receive the anticoagulants. And, and an acute kidney injury is very common in these patients. So case fatality rate is only 2.3% and majority of the deaths were elderly. But if you see the comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, COVID, uh, uh, cancer, and COPD, they're all associated uh, comorbidities which ocean the prognosis. If you see SARS and MARS, there was 10% mortality in SARS and 37% mortality in MARS. But here we just have 2.3%. But it's a very infectious virus, though 
less fertile. That's why the death rate is less. And yet this in the center level, we have got almost 75% recovery with a death rate of only 1.8%. And in the state, we have got almost 70% recovery with a death rate of 0.5%. So that tells that uh, it may not be very fertile, but it's very infectious. But those who sink need special care. So poor prognostic markers are the bacterial and the fungal co-infection, the elderly, the obese, the um, risk factors like the acute smoker, the bacterial co-infections, the lymphopenia, the multilobar infiltrations, hypertensives, and the elderly patient. And uh, the usually the mortality is because of cytokine storm, secondary sepsis, comorbidity, immunosuppression, and lack of timely intervention. So final word regarding vaccination. You must have many doubts regarding vaccination. I'll tell that it's very difficult for a RNA virus to have a timely vaccine. And many attempts are on. Many countries are ahead. Russia has already launched. China is, has already launched. And the Oxford and the uh, different world institutes and also national institutes like ICMR, Serum Institute, Bharat Bharti, uh, Moderna, all are in the process. But it's unlikely to come before end of this year or beginning of the next year. And, 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 and there will be many issues. It will be short acting. You know, the fact today is that 50 days only is the antibody life. And the antibody disappears after that from the circulation. So reinfection has been reported by now. And the most important thing that the vaccine which will come, maybe a very frequent vaccine, maybe a yearly vaccine, which can keep, but how long the antibody will stay, that's a big question, and we're still waiting for the vaccination to take place. Before I end, this is a government guideline for non-COVID hospitals, thus not to neglect the COVID and to keep them uh, uh, COVID and non-COVID separate and to monitor them very well uh, uh, and, and not to deny treatment to any patient. Uh, uh, all of you have come across that and the proper IPC has to be maintained which include all patient attendants, staff and the uh, COVID uh, team should wear masks at all point of time and restrict the entry of the patient attendant and the crowding at the hospital and the precautions for the healthcare providers will be wearing the mask, PPE, refrain from touching eye, nose and mouth and potentially contaminated globes or the ungloved hands and you have to avoid contaminating the environment surfaces and, and, and you have to wash your do hand and do a hand hygiene before and after touching each patient, before and after any procedure and uh, before uh, after uh, the uh, patient surrounding are touched and uh, after any exposure to our body fluids is done. And hospital disinfection has to be done properly. Uh, with 0.5% uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite solution as well as 70% uh, absolute alcohol and the contact period of the chemical uh, is important and the medical waste has to be disposed very properly. So the hospital disinfection, infection prevention control, hand wash, mask and social distancing is very important in our procedure and uh, private hospitals were allowed to keep COVID patients uh, by now have to uh, see that every patient is managed well and there is no admixture between the COVID and non-COVID section which can result in the uh, increase in the patient number. So we have to remember final, finally the washing hands, wearing mask, hand sanitizer and keeping distance and we have to be careful because by reflex we come together and there are chances that will be super spreader. The, it's sixth month on and a lot of mental stress for many. There are financial issues. Many people are committing suicide, but I tell as COVID warriors, keep patience. We have just one month left. We are approaching the peak and post peak things will come down. And if you have good patience, if you have a good approach, you can save many lives. You may be in any stream. You may be in the IOS, you may be in allopathy, you may be a healthcare personnel, a pharmacist or a sister attached to ICU or a, a junior doctor, a resident or a first year postgraduate. But if you approach the patient well, their uh, case definition is in the travel history, the contact history, the symptoms, then testing, 
and uh, deciding whether it's a mild, moderate, severe, sending to the right place, detecting in the time, the testings are done, and when to refer to the um, dedicated COVID hospital centers or dedicated COVID hospitals, when to start oxygen, when to start steroid, when to start convulsant plasma, when to start the antivirals, and then finally, when to intubate and when to put the patient under ventilator. If you are thorough in that, all these guidelines are available in the website of the Department of Health and Family Welfare, Odisha, as well as uh, the central website. So you can download the guidelines. I'll also post my slides for your reference, and you can take them. And any time any issue comes, you can be in touch with the panel. The medical colleges have panel of doctors, experts, professors who are moving around with different COVID hospitals, and guiding them in their management. You can put forth before the panel or you can put forth by email or by message to any doctor whom you know personally. So uh, thank you for the hearing. Thank you for the patience for this long presentation. I was a little elaborative because I wanted that you should uh, take it uh, very seriously and you should be thorough in your approach. I'm sure there'll be many uh, questions. We'll uh, take up the questions uh, after a short case presentation by Dr. Shampad Das. Dr. Shampad Das is a pulmonologist. He is MD pulmonary medicine from SCB Medical College. He is now in charge of the uh, Oswini COVID hospital. And uh, to his experience, he has participated in the last five months very elaborately. And his presentations are liked by our delegates, our doctors and our participants very much. I'm sure he'll uh, show you a good case and will continue a case-based discussion regarding uh, management of mild to moderate patient, which you come across day in and day out. I uh, request all our panels to stay back another 10, 15 minutes till Shampad finishes, then we'll take up all your questions. Our uh, Professor Amar Patnake has joined, and Professor Nivita Pani is there online, Dr. Thato is there online. And I request everyone to be there for the panel and all your questions will be taken. Now we present you Dr. Shampad Das for a case-based discussion on management of mild to moderate patients. Dr. Shampad. Sir, I'm not able to share my screen. So uh, you can uh, mail me your slides. You are a co-host. We are making you co-host just a minute. Uh, Shampad, you can share from there. I'm making you co-host. connected in between so uh, i'm asking them to make you co-host now okay. Uh, they are make uh, the Department of Health and Family Welfare is requested uh, on the call uh, to make uh, Dr. Shampad the co host. And by that time, uh, you're uh, taken up, uh, you can start discussing uh, with our delegates. Dr. Shampad, uh, you can share slides now. Dr. Dr. Thato is here, he has surfaced. Hello, uh, unmute yourself. Okay, so uh, uh, good afternoon all. So thank you, Jan sir, for inviting me again uh, to talk on what we say uh, a case presentation. But today I'm going to deviate a bit from my 
uh, regular way of presenting case what i am going to talk about is that how do we actually assess uh, something a covid who is actually a seriously ill so this is what i am going to talk today it is not a normal case present uh, because uh, every aspect of it has been dealt in detail by jan sir so i'll be just uh, highlighting a few points that uh, where do we actually need to intervene right so this is what i am going to talk about so whenever a patient patient actually today uh, means more or less i'll be talking about the covid care center so whenever a patient comes actually this is what has been taught to us in our uh, medical uh, call, uh, schools like you need to take a detailed history examination investigation diagnosis and treatment right so this is how we uh, means go ahead with all the patients uh, which we are having but covid patients actually when they approach few of them are a bit serious so if you go through all these uh, conventional protocols this takes time right so taking a detailed history doing a examination so these are not feasible investigation so what we are concerned is that time so this is what is life right in a covid time is life you cannot just wait and wait and wait and wait until the patient is bad and then you decide that you need to intervene that's not because uh, you if you clearly see in these two picture you can see on the left side and the right side both are being given an oxygen and you could clearly know that which is a patient can give you time and which cannot so in a covid care center when you see these type of patients and you both uh, both patients are there and you have the uh, luxury of sending one to the covid hospital so you can clearly know that which you need to send early and which you need to send late so uh, looking at the patient i can clearly say that it is on the left side of the patient that is who is sweating drowsy so this is the one who requests to be sent to the covid hospital immediately rather than the other one who can wait so this is something a uh, jurisdiction of the patient transfer which is very very much essential in a covid care center when the numbers are increasing the seats are less the the uh, manpower or the resources are limited so that's something which need to be taken care of now shifting a patient doesn't end up there right so when we are planning that a patient moves from covid care center to a covid hospital so we have decided to send means it's gone no that's not so please try to understand that whenever there is a plan about shifting a patient the important thing is that the resuscitation must always be covered or must always be done in the covid care center right so whatever the problem it is whether the patient is having difficulty in breathing you can start up with oxygen you can start with a nebulizer If patient is quite symptomatic, you can give a dilapidin. If the blood pressure is going down, you can give an IV fluid. So these are the basic things which I think should be done in more or less in all of the COVID uh, dedicated COVID health centers also. COVID care center may not give you that luxury, but COVID health centers can. So what we do is that whenever a patient comes to us, the immediate problem and the probable diagnosis. These are the two things. Obviously, the COVID is the diagnosis. but the immediate problem means why the patient has come to us is it because of the hypoxia is it the patient is stressless enough patient is drowsy enough patient is not able the blood pressure is not maintaining so the immediate problem is one part and the probable diagnosis is another part so when we say covid comes with a ards right so that's the diagnosis and the problem is hypoxia so the resuscitation takes or should be done with both of it taking simultaneously so the immediate problems of a hypoxia you need to put the patient on ventilator if required or give oxygen with the reservoir masks and the probable diagnosis means covid you need to treat with all other things so both of it has to be treated simultaneously again whenever you are resuscitating these patients once you have started the resuscitation you again review your that how much Uh, have the patient improved with your resuscitation? Is there something other than only COVID, or how much the patient has responded to your resuscitation? And again, it continues to the same way. So it is probably a cycle with which we need or we should manage a COVID, right? So the immediate problem and the probable diagnosis both has to be uh, taken care of. Again, revise. So what I have told uh, maybe around uh, a few presentation back that whenever a critical or some patient require more attention it is something like you assess the problem you treat the problem you again assess the problem so assess treat and assess this is how it is a cycle type of thing that should always be continued till from the covid care center you are able to shift the patient to the covid hospital 
or in a covid hospital this is how we actually approach to the problems of the patients do not leave the patient unlet until he is stable it is something which is a very important aspect which uh, we do and i would also suggest in a covid care center that the uh, patient is hypoxic the, uh, hypoxic means put on oxygen and you just walk off that should not be the attitude because you don't know when the patient will suddenly arrest and we don't want the patient to arrest uh, in front of others so do not leave any unstable patient and walk off so this is the fundamental of all critical care management now which i always talk about is something called as parallel action parallel action means when we say in a uh, uh, in our uh, regular activities that airway breathing circulation has to be maintained so we say a b c so it's not like that it is something like a b and c is taken care simultaneously that is suppose you want to put the patient on oxygen immediately collect oxygen one more sister goes to iv access and put a saline and the blood investigation or abg is said so in a critical care aspect it is always a parallel action that is all three things are going on simultaneously you don't have to think that i will do this one first then will do that then will do this no so it is always parallel you have to take care of the airway immediately you have to get an iv access and you have to do an abg or any of the investigation which you want to do so parallel action is something which must be uh, done in all critically ill patients now histories you can get sometimes the patient relative can give you a history about what has happened we get a history from medical or paramedical staff who is accompanying or the notes and charts what i suggest is that uh, whenever a patient is being transferred from one center to the other i would simply request uh, the doctors or the pharmacist uh, technician out there to please write down a short history that why the patient needs to be transferred and what is the immediate problem for which the patient is being transferred so that it is easy because there we don't have the patient or the relatives to speak we only have that uh, this patient is coming this is the scenario so i would say so for example uh, around two days back uh, one patient was actually a known case of lscs being shifted to us from one of the center and uh, we received the patient in a gasping state so we don't know what was there the patient was totally ecteric was there uh, so whether it is a complication related to pregnancy and the patient is found to be covid positive and no documents were clearly available with us so and the patient actually expired within 2 hours so this is something which uh, should not be there during the transport because remember the transport is not abandoning the patient it is about continuing the care from the covid care center to the covid dedicated covid health center to the covid hospital so it is the care which has to continue from 1 to 2 to 3 so this is but for it to continue you need to have a proper documentation which has to be given in the patients so uh, i have talked about it always think that you need to address the immediate problem first which is a very important aspect but whenever a patient gets admitted to any of the covid care center covid hospital or the covid uh, uh, dedicated covid health center so the two important things which are major part or which determines that what is the chance of this patient to survive is the exercise tolerance that is whether the patient was able to mobilize himself at home or was able to do his day to day activities was able to climb up stairs how many foot he uh, means stairs he could climb up so these are important things second and the foremost important is the previous major illness which has been talked in detail by uh, jansa that uh, diabetes hypertension ckd and other things so get a history of these things in the patients who are getting admitted to the covid care center or to a covid health center and in our center obviously it is a mandatory because we have to deal with all these things treatment i have talked about there are two treatments which has to take place the definitive treatment obviously we have to treat covid with all the things which has been given in the guidelines but equally important is the supportive treatment uh, suppose the patient is hypoxic you have to give oxygen suppose the patient is going to respiratory arrest you have to give ventilator patient is hypotensive you have to give fluids so definitive treatment is one part which has to be done and supportive treatment is the other part which must be done in all patients so if you combine both of this then only the, your outcome will be better so you can very well see that what is supportive treatment if you see that this building is standing straight obviously you see that the patient is conscious so when come and uh, talking to you one part 
this is the same building which is standing straight but see the amount of support so this is the fundamental that is you can have the patient in the same condition but the support may be there changing suppose one patient is with 2 liter of oxygen saturation 97 and suppose some patient is on 8 liter of oxygen with saturation 97 so don't be happy that your saturation is 97 means your patient is doing good so this support or the amount of support that a patient is requiring or the amount of support that a patient is requiring over a period of time is something which is a very important aspect in deciding so let's now just give you a graphical representation of what is going on with this patient so if you see this is the heart rate showing in 120 uh, and this red line is the blood pressure suppose a blood perfusion uh, infusion is going on you can see that the blood is maintaining once plasma and colloids so what is happening you can see whenever the infusion is uh, we are giving any fluid bolus the bp is coming down uh, coming up and again going down so this type of graphical representation i think that's not very much feasible in covid care center but in covid hospitals this is something to be taken care of so whatever support you are giving is the patient responding to your support so this graphical can just give you an idea that if you are giving some support that means a patient is responding once the support goes out the patient is going down so hypotension and uh, other things when you are giving fluids it is responding so you have to give more fluid so talking just about a bit of examination what you need to do in rapidly suppose patient is deteriorating these are something that rapid determination of appropriate resuscitation assessability and limited examination covid you cannot have a broad examination like inspection palpation percussion no so limit your examination but assess the severity this is something which i always want to talk or want to emphasize is that limit your examination but please assess your severity that it is how severe it is it now these are the four types of persons where the covid can be more detrimental like patients who are oncology patients where if you have a covid they will not show the response till they go down and suddenly deteriorate patients who are diabetic immunosuppressive they are actually something difficult and old age so these three patients are actually something which are dangerous groups because their response will be for a late time and then they will go down but this fourth one this is something typical of covid the young patients but who are happy hypoxic right so they they their saturation may be low but they are very happy to it that they don't respond to it so all these three things obviously require uh, intervention but these fourth thing or this area that is this person actually he is happy but he is hypoxic so this is a typical of covid which we need to be very very cautious about because in this patients actually the oxygen will be going down the patient will not be complaining of the of things so these are the parameters which has been told by uh, jansa but i am still emphasizing it that uh, oncology this uh, diabetes comorbidities old age we do take care of but in young patients also please be sure that the oxygen saturation is maintaining otherwise you make the patient land up in a scenario where it is difficult to revive so uh, this is something which we say you have to wear a pp but parallel action means i have told limited examination assess severity so suppose you are just looking into a pulse by doing a radial pulse also see the breathing pattern so this is which i talked about parallel means limit examination assess severity suppose you are uh, looking into the radial pulse by that time you can very well see the respiration and how the patient's uh, sensorium is there so this is something which i talk about now uh, talking a bit about the blood pressure please remember whenever there is a hypotension or a septic shock starts the important thing is that your heart rate will go up so don't expect that a patient having a normal blood pressure is normal with a heart rate of 130 so there is something wrong so this is the physiology of it whenever your blood pressure goes down there occurs vasoconstriction and your heart rate goes up so in septic shock the first clinical parameters which you will find is a tachycardia so this is very important and so this is what i was talking about please remember there are few things a b c airway breathing and circulation so in circulation problems the first important thing is tachycardia followed by which you will get a hypotension so these are the investigation which we do so if it is available well and good for you 
uh, you can go for sodium potassium uh, magnesium uh, phosphorus depend upon the patient status the renal function liver function abg and chest x ray so this is the fundamental if you have it well and good it's a luxury and you should utilize it now talking a bit about airway that is who are the patients who will land up in problem remember uh, strider may be absent in airway obstruction particularly means suppose someone is having severe airway edema or someone is suffocating don't expect that once there is strider means there will be problem no because many a times even with severe obstruction the strider will go away that's something normal oxygen saturation does not exclude compromise airway so please remember what i'm talking about is airway airway means your the route with which you inhale means from the nose to larynx to pharynx to the trachea so i am talking about the airway so don't think that strider is something which is required normal saturation doesn't say that saturation normal hence the patient doesn't require any ventilation or intubation that is not to be done because suppose patient is going drowsy patient is not able to uh, means breathing at maybe around 50 or 60 per minute that's something which has to be taken care of so do not think that saturation is something which is important to think that a patient is able to ventilate suppose a patient is tachypneic and severely breathing and but slowly over time when you see, when you see that a patient is going down or becoming drowsy that means the patient's mechanism has exhausted and he is in incipient respiratory failure so many a times the young physician feel that a patient has become good the restlessness have come down and he is sleeping quietly so once he sleeps quietly he will always be sleeping so remember in a hypoxic patient the patient will never sleep or never become drowsy so once drowsy means carbon dioxide is going up thirdly patient severely tachypneic so there is a stress remember when there is a hypoxic tachypneic patient when the heart rate is going down is bad so these are the two things which i talk about in a breathing part so i talked about the airway then talking about a breathing so mark tachypnea is a good marker of severe ill so more the respiratory rate more bad is a patient pulse oximeter is good but that doesn't give you any, any idea about the carbon dioxide part so if your saturation is low obviously the patient requires abg to say you tachypnea suppose when we say we find some patient there is severely tachypneic but the abg parameter showing metabolic acidosis so this is what you will get in patients of ckd with covid who may present to the covid uh, care center and they will be tachypneic so don't think that it is because of this respiratory part rather it is a metabolic part for which they are tachypneic but if someone is tachypneic and slowly going down which i again talk about patient of hypoxia becoming drowsy or the respiratory rate is going down they are just arousable the heart rate is going down that means patient is going to arrest so please remember if a patient is going down be sure that there is something wrong so when to worry when your respiratory rate is more than 30 the patient is not able to speak even half a sentence He is agitated, confused, taking out all of the lines, and the saturation is less than ninety percent, and deteriorating despite therapy. So, if a patient is having COVID, patient is having any of these things, be sure that the patient gets transferred to a COVID hospital. Talking about circulation, a bit of it which we find day in day out, what we call as septic shock. Always remember, I have talked that hypotension is a late feature. The first feature is always your heart rate going up. so when your heart rate goes up or there is a tachycardia means the patient is going to septic shock it is not that you get a hypotension then you will feel so remember whenever your perfusion goes down the patient will become drowsy the peripheries will become cold patient will not have a urine output and acidosis is seen on abg so hypotension will all cause all these features now uh i have talked about a bit of hypotension so for you all so if your systolic blood pressure is less than 90 means it is a hypotension and consciousness uh, 
this, this is something an important thing. Patient going down in the absence of neurological disease, that is the patient is slowly deteriorating. Again, looking that if your patient is deteriorating, means it is something bad. So please remember your tachypneic patient or patient with respiratory disease going down or becoming drowsy is bad. So again, talking the same thing. Now to summarize it, because today I told that I'm not going to talk about the cases, but to summarize or when we need to see that who are the patients who are problematic and need to get transferred. This is what to our means my topic today is that any patient having altered conscious state is bad. Any patient having hypotension obviously is bad because the patient has gone to septic shock. Any patient having tachycardia, because I have told that the first symptoms in a hypotension is tachycardia, not BP going down. So heart rate remaining 120, 130 is bad because it is a septic shock. Tachypnea, any patient where the respiratory rate is more than 30, the patient is going more bad, is to be shifted, is bad. Any type of hypoxia or cyanosis, you see bluish discoloration of the lips or of the tips of the finger, that is bad. Patient not passing urine is bad and acidosis is obviously an APG fissures. So in this, what I have told is that when these patients are getting admitted to COVID care center or COVID health center, there are few things which must be seen from a doctor as well as a nurse perspective. You need to look into that how severe it is. You need to look into the airway that whether the patient is able to ventilate itself or not. You need to look into the breathing that how much oxygen is required or not. You need to look into the circulation. So A, B, C has to be looked into it. And secondly, the support requirement which you are giving either in the form of fluids or in the form of oxygen or in the form of other supportive measures, how much the support is required. So if the support required is slowly increasing over time, that means the patient is going bad. So as a whole, I would say that it is a team effort. Please try to maintain the treatment from the COVID care center to the dedicated COVID health center to the COVID hospital by proper documentation of the referral and proper treatment so that it is followed up till the patient gets discharged. So thank you for uh, uh, listening to me so patiently. Thank you, Dr. Shampan. Uh, that was a clear presentation on how you should go uh, in a center where you are approaching the first line patients, how to uh, work them out, how to support them, and when to send them uh, to a, a dedicated COVID hospital or a, a dedicated COVID hospital center. Uh, now, uh, on request, uh, Professor Niveta Pani will uh, take uh, five minutes to tell you regarding awake proning because uh, many of our doctors have requested to listen awake proning uh, from ma'am and uh, I also request Professor Patnaik to join us and we'll start the panel very soon taking up your questions. Uh, please stay back. Madam has unmuted. Yeah, yeah. 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 Jayant, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. You are audible. You are audible. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let me start. When the patient we should do for proning? Actually, what do you mean by the conscious proning? The patient information, you have to make a seat for the conscious proning. These instructions are for the patient who have been advised to under, undertake for the conscious proning. And remember that, please try not to spend a lot of time lying flat on your back, lying on your stomach, and in different position will help you body to get air into all areas of your lung. Then siddha no so hi ki pitti re apun mane petta madi ki ki ma different position ne jadi soi be bama kora madi dhana kora madi pette ikiri bossi ki thale eta definitely apun ko helpful haba. So kaun amar recommendation koi ki? It is recommended. To change your position every 30 minutes to 2 hours, rotating. So, what are the first 30 minutes to 2 hours? What you will do? Lying fully prone on your stomach. Mane pura pette ikri, madikri, apna mane soibe. Next 30 minutes, kaun karibe? Next 30 minutes to 2 hours, lying on your right side. Mane dahana kaun madikri, apna soibe. 
then next 30 minutes of kalpan karibe 30 minutes to 2 hours sitting up to 30 to 60 degree by adding by adjusting head of the bed mane siddha bhabare no soi ki 30 to 60 degree incline position ne bed upare soi ba ko chesta karibe ba basiba ko chesta karibe next phase re kon karibe 30 minutes to 2 hours lying on your left side of the bed mane bam kon maadi ki soi be then back to position 1 tale amara panchati position nei ki ame mane jiba prathom 30 minute to 2 ghanta bhitare jeti ki paribe ta tu jodi apan ko kashta hala hue ta apan patient ko jodi kashta hala apan man ta ko maadi basi kariba uchit nu 30 minute to 2 hour lying fully prone on your stomach pura pette ki maadi ki soibe jemti gote chhoto chhua tie ta maa ro upare janma hi sala pare maa kol upare jetebe suye maa ta ko titi tha padai Next 30 minutes to 2 hours, right side, but Dahana Kora Madikiri upon a suibe. Next 30 minutes to 2 hours, Bossi Kiri, a mixture 30 to 60 degree, adjusting head of the bed to suibe. Next 30 minutes upon a lying on your left side, but Bama Kora Madiki suibe, then to the back to the position. Muapanu a picture to the Koji. I think the you can see the picture. Uh, is the picture uh, visible, uh, Jan? Yeah, yeah, visible, visible, visible. Is it clear? Madam, if you want to uh, share slides, we can uh, co-host you. Uh, no, it's all right. It's okay? It's visible one. Jan, is the picture is clear? Yeah, picture is uh, not clear, but visible. I mean, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to proning house. Proning going to go to the house. Different part position help the body to get air into all the areas of the lungs. If we go to the house, we have to go to the house. We have to go to the house. We have to go to the house. We have to go so, NIV is a conscious proning position. We have to do it. The patient is uncomfortable. We have to do it. 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 We have to do dedicated COVID hospital. We have to do it. Only for the, can be with three to four persons and with a sophisticated uh, intensivist. Intensivist must be there to handle the. Uh, uh, proning when the patient is in a ventilator. In the conscious proning, we have to say that the patient is proning because it is very easy. If the patient is very easy, the patient is very easy. If the patient is very easy, the patient is very easy. If the patient is very easy, the patient is very easy. If the patient is very Back to position. I think I am very clear, or anybody has any question and you can ask in the chat box. Jant, am I okay? Uh, yeah, it's, it's okay, madam. I am very clear. 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 Anything which comes will put to you. Uh, before that, uh, I invite Professor Patnak, our uh, head of culinary medicine and nodal officer SCB, and sir may uh, put a word regarding the electronic in these patients which uh, professor pani has already covered thank you Jan. Uh, you know uh, this is not a not a new concept actually in 2013 before the, before that the concept of proning has come in the ventilated patient so it is indicated in case of a severe COPD where the prone ventilation is done for 16 hours. So when the patient is intubated in severe ARDS, patient is getting uh, different drugs like a paralytic agent and also sedation. So for this proning, you require a whole good team. At least eight members are required for the proning of the patients. And uh, the duration of running is around 16 hours. So it is a very difficult task. So when this COVID comes, we have seen a lot of patients are hypoxemic from the beginning. 
and uh, as you know the mainstay of treatment is the oxygen so how to increase the effectiveness of the oxygen we have to uh, that is another factor so what we see that there are two types of pathology one is this inflammatory pathology another is the vascular pathology as is concerned so you recall there is a vico mismatch and as you know the posteriorly mainly the lower lobe is situated anteriorly the upper lobe is situated so by proning we are definitely of the lower lobe so there will be increase in ventilation so that's why more aeration is done so there will be less mismatch and the hypoxemia is corrected again let us consider about the upper other lobes if a, there is a lateral segment of upper lobes and uh, for that if you do the lateral decubitus position madam joda kahile je dahan pote soiwa ke ba pote soiwa jo is that area also get more aeration right? getting more oxygenation so that by that we are decreasing in the hypoxemia in those patient and if a hypoxemia is uh, decreasing and patient is more comfortable as there is a less work of breathing and definitely patient will be improved with this maneuver if we are failing with this maneuver we are not increasing the oxygenation then we take the other maneuver help then we are getting for a non invasive ventilation and other thing that should be considered but definitely it is a very very important uh, things we can adopt this even covid care center in other hospitals also they can adopt this very easily from the beginning it will do it. definitely the uh, end result better and we get lot of not expensive also you don't have to spend anything just you have to instruct the patient in a change of position i i think उंसिल let us listen to dr shampad because he is also proponent of uh... sir what i am saying is that around uh, 60% of patients uh, become comfortable with awake proning uh, but 20 to 30% may not like that uh, position which has been told by nipeta by madam also so don't force it so the patient should be uh, uh, advised to go for a proning If he feels comfortable, because many a patient feels comfortable after proning because their breathlessness comes down, so they will do on their own. That's not an issue. But it is not always mandatory that you force a very tachypneic, restless patient to prone, and by the time you prone, the patient may be arrest. So uh, that's something which uh, has to be taken care of while doing the conscious proning. Yes, yes, rightly taken. And Dr. Thakur is also with us, and uh, he has joined from the beginning. So uh, I I want uh, Dr. Thakur to uh, put his opinion regarding these uh, COVID care centers, the first line centers, receiving the patients, and uh, uh, how uh, they should go about their uh, initial workup and uh, when they should refer the patient to the uh, right uh, center, maybe dedicated COVID hospital uh -huh. center, or dedicated COVID. Hospital. Most important investigation they have is the available routine investigation. But that every COVID center should have sufficient pulse oximeter to measure the patient or person's oxygen saturation. If happy person is saturation is okay, doctor is happy, patient is happy, not happy hypoxia, then it's well and good. Do some awake proning that exercise which will help them. Nivedita uh, Madam has rightly pointed out. So uh, if patient is febrile and uh, any of the doctor Sampath has told directly the warning points, uh, you know the altered mentation, tachycardia, tachypnea, and SpO2 going down, these are some markers they must pick up and send the patient. So these things, you know, 
वांस दिस हैज बीन अकर्ड एंड पेशेंट अटेंडेंट डाकिबो ताको डाकिकी डॉक्टर का सो सो दे शुड बी पीरियडिकली ऑब्जर्व दीज आर दी बाय साइंस आर देयर और नॉट इफ दीज अर्ली वार्निंग साइंस आर देयर देन बेटर टू रेफर द पेशेंट टू डेडिकेटेड कोविड हॉस्पिटल एंड इन देयर सिचुएशन दे आर ट्रीटिंग ऑल माइल्ड पेशेंट्स आइसोलेटिंग द पेशेंट्स एंड अवेक क्रोनिक इज सफिशिएंट फॉर देम एंड ऑब्जर्विंग द ऑक्सीजन सैचुरेशन आई थिंक सो सर Dr. Deepak is uh, here with us, and he is from WHO, you know. And uh, WHO has played an important role uh, during this pandemic. And every day, day in and day out, I don't think that they are taking their food and rest in time. In the last uh, five, six months, running around, uh, so he has a very good observation regarding all these issues. I uh, request him to uh, speak uh, something in this on this situation, and also. You can share your slides, Dr. Deepak. Are you there? I think he has left. He has left. So then we'll take up the questions. Uh, any anything? Any panel want to speak before we take up the questions? Dr. Deepak, you are muted. So. we have a good number of questions and uh, the questions are generally based on the treatment uh, issues the first question was uh, uh, regarding the which is the ideal test for the diagnosis of covid-19 for suspected ipd patients in non covid hospitals so this was the question uh uh answering this i'll put my opinion that uh, we do a rapid antigen test if it, if rapid antigen is positive you have don't have any doubt immediately you can send the patient to covid facility if rapid antigen is negative and still you are strongly suspecting uh, covid still put the patient in isolation because we have seen many people who are rapid antigen positive and later have come rt pcr positive even rt pcr negative letter has come rt pcr positive again so if you have clinical uh, picture if you have radiological picture if you have symptoms if you have sari ili features and if you are uh, thinking that this is a case of covid 19 put the patient in isolation whatever the situation may be case positivity or negativity i think professor patnaik yes, will tell uh, the question uh, the question is uh, regarding the ipd not yeah. opd it is ipd so definitely when the patient is being admitted and the gold standard test is the rt pcr definitely if the patient is admitted we will go for the rt pcr because that is the gold standard of uh, again now what happens there is a certain kit like rapid rapid test. that is a very also this uh, important point yes. the dependence whether is available or not but uh, you can send the patient for the the rt pcr That yeah. is the gold standard, yeah, and adequately, uh, they can be done. Yeah, one advantage. Yeah. One advantage was it was available very first the yeah. anti antigen test. Yeah. But uh, in view of the shortage of the kits, uh, you can send uh, RT PCR, but you have to keep the patient in isolation. That yeah. is very important. Uh, the other question was uh, how long the COVID positive asymptomatic patient remains positive. So, uh, Dr. Suresh Mishra wanted to know. that uh, the infectivity suppose patient doesn't have symptom you kept 10 days and you left how long the patient may continue positive because we are not testing if yeah uh, so uh, there is actually very good uh, article in ngm and uh, this uh, new england uh, this is a uh, what is your ngm or what ngm 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 acha so the article uh, this is a study uh, is uh, conducted in that uh, Happened in the ship, the infected ship. So they have uh, this article has mentioned about the uh, natural history in the asymptomatic patient, right? So they have and they uh, they are of the opinion that usually it depends on the age of the patient, right? The if the age is increasing, you have got um, another four days more. That is remaining positive. Even if younger the patient, they are 36 years, 30 years, 
even if uh, within seven days, seven days you are getting negativity. But in case of patient with yeah. older age, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, that even goes up to 15 days. This is the usual natural history. And as you know that in uh, majority of patients, there are uh, in our country, usually the younger patients are more affected. So it is expected below 10 days, they have become a negative. That's why government of India has uh, stopped the, doing the test after the 10 days. Yeah. So uh, that is true uh, because the infectivity is not there. So we are not testing in a community health point of view, but patient may still continue to become positive, which may not be a danger to the family or the contacts. So, uh, and also by that time, the, the more days is going, you're getting a less viral, viral load also decreasing. Yeah. So they become also non-infectious. Non-infectious. So yeah. even if they were positive, yeah. they're non-infectious. Non yeah. That's why we are not having any epidemiological importance of uh, working them out. So uh, the, the next question is uh, a lot of question regarding hydroxychloroquine. So the, uh, many people have uh, wanted to know what is the position, what is, what is the placement of hydroxychloroquine at present? Uh, why there is global confusion about hydroxychloroquine? Even uh, the, those mildly symptomatic who were giving azithromycin but routinely were not giving hydroxychloroquine. And because it uh, uh, prevents the membrane fusion and endocytosis of the virus, it's an affordable drug and we have a good experience. It should be uh, utilized Why this is over uh, underutilized. So regarding this, there is also the last study that I uh, published uh, recently. They don't have over the either in a prophylaxis or during the treatment of the positive patient. Right? And more of is more and that study is conducted in the american and other european countries where uh, even we are accustomed with the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine the complication or adverse effect is less in india but it is not established that it is a beneficial in covid positive so that, that's why the global confusion they are uh, not finding any good effect and they are finding the bad effect only so that's why the global confusion. Uh, yeah, uh, recent uh, trial come. Yeah, it is not in favor. Yeah, recently recovery trial has come. It is not in favor of uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. But still, ICMR is recommending, and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, is recommending in mild cases those who are aged more than 60 with comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension. If their cardiac problem is not there and cardiac safety is there one can go for getting hydroxychloroquine. Ministry of Health uh, guideline till that. And uh, prophylaxis ICMR guideline is till that, but the, ICE, the recovery trial shows not much benefit. Yeah. Recently, and, it is put in the end. And regarding this, also, if you see the new guideline of treatment of COVID, yeah, they have given hydro HCQs or hydrogen, yeah. right? Now, Favipiravir is plenty available. Yes. And he was explaining that Favipiravir is having a more toxic drugs and all that. We don't find this. Uh, we are using the patient. Their patient is taking and tolerating well with the patient. Yes. And uh, drugs is available. When the drugs is available, you for the mild cases also, you can try with the Favipiravir. So, that is the right opinion. I will take the opinion of Dr. Shampad also. Are you using hydroxychloroquine at your setup? Mild to moderate patient? No, sir. Uh, we are, I have stopped using hydroxychloroquine because once pavipiravir is available, there is no recommendation or guideline to use SCQ with uh, pavipiravir. Uh, yes. So uh, I am not using anymore. Yeah, so the summary is though ICMR is recommended for prophylaxis of high-risk persons and uh, comorbid patients and also treatment. The uh, hydroxychloroquine less used because of uh, doubtful efficacy and uh, QT prolongation, retinal effects and other toxicities. And a good thing is that febipiravir is more and more tolerated and better tolerated by the people and they have an equal placement in the approach. So mild to moderate people can receive febipiravir safely in place of hydroxychloroquine. So that, that can... Regarding prophylaxis, 
we can continue hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis because it's recommended. But for treatment, favipiravir is the option. Yeah. Those who are mild to moderate or having some symptoms, you can yes. first line choose favipiravir 200 milligram, a nine tablet BD day one and a four tablet BD five yes. to six. And we have also plenty of drugs. And please, I request to use the drugs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's available even at uh, ACB uh, COVID uh, ward. So patient comes, attends, and takes the course. It's free of cost. Yeah. So uh, with this, I request uh, Dr. Deepak, who is there, reconnected, and uh, he'll share and he'll speak uh, to our audience a little regarding the uh, this uh, issue of. Uh, Managing cases at CCC. Dr. Deepak. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Jan, sir, and Dr. Amar, sir. And thank you, Tatu, sir. Uh, as we should know, all the people who are working in the CCC, you know, this is a viral disease, and uh, in viral disease, antibodies have got no role. So, whatever we know about remdesivir or SCQ or whatever, all those things are all, all in the research phase. So as of now, what we should think is how to save lives, how to manage our patients who are there in our CCC. It is immaterial whether we are referring those cases to SCB or whether we are referring those cases to any dedicated COVID hospitals or we are referring those cases to dedicated COVID health centers. What your priority should be, how to keep those patients alive before being discharged from a government setup. So when you receive a case who has got a low oxygenation concentration, the first point is you give the oxygen, either it is high flow or low flow, that uh, I am not uh, interested to uh, tell you that whether there should be the low flow or high flow. That depends upon how you are going to manage the uh, CCC or DCSC. But how to save a life, I think it is the best known to the doctor who is treating the case, that whether that patient should be lived or whether that patient is going to die, that depends upon the doctor who is treating the case. Now, point number two, two is all uh, Jayan sir, MR sir, Tatoi sir, or Nibeta madam, all are discussed in detail how to go for treatment of the cases, awake pruning, treatments, referrals, everything has been discussed. So please go through that. And if you have got any issues, we can, we can plan for another session, another such session like this, where we can go about discussing about Jansar or MRSR or Nibita Man, how to do or how to refer the cases to different uh, DCSC or DCH from CCC. So please uh, uh, put your questions. So please uh, have your questions ready so that we can go ahead in the next time. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Jansar and MRSR and uh, Nibita Madam, Tatovi sir. All the yes. people were involved in this training. Thanks a lot. It was a great learning option for all the people who are in, uh, working in CCC in Qatar. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, Deepak. We, we have a couple of questions uh, still to answer. And uh, you are looking like a yogi, what I see. <laughs> your uh, hair has grown long and uh, your uh, skin has turned black. So the COVID award of 2020 should go to you in Odisha. That I'll propose to the health department. Uh, your uh, physiology looks altered and geography looks changed. So good that you are contributing for the society. We pray for you uh, and we will take up the questions. Uh, the next question is when to give azithromycin to a patient admitted in CCC. So uh, the patient uh, uh, is symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, that has not been uh, mentioned there. But the role of azithromycin. I want uh, uh, Dr. Thakur, will you answer yes. this? Yeah, azithromycin, you know, we can give in the azithromycin not only an antibiotic, it has some immunomodulatory effect. So for that effect, we can use uh, azithromycin even in sick patients also. Yeah. Azithromycin, more to sick. We can yeah. use azithromycin safely. Yeah. We have seen ivermectin effect. Yeah, erythromycin, doxycycline, ivermectin, all these drugs what we are selecting, they have uh, additional immunomodulatory effects. So routinely you will give in to a frail patient or uh, with fever or minimal symptoms you will start. 
if patient is asymptomatic and all things are normal, no need of which are majority patients, they do not need any type of treatment. Only if some cold or headache is there, anti cold measure that is there. If they are febrile, mild to moderate, in those category, initial part three antiviral options are there. One is habibravir, and with that I can add azithromycin. Second option was hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, which is not being used, and everybody is now denying. And the third option for that was ivermectin plus doxycycline. I also don't prefer for that. If habibravir is there and well tolerated, one can go for habibravir. And with that, one can add azithromycin as immunomodulatory effect. So, I think... I think that's clear. Sir, so, what is the, your opinion regarding the duration of treatment, azithromycin duration of treatment? Azithromycin, five days. So, you recommend for five days. Yes. So, do you think that uh, this therapy will have any immunomodulatory effect? So uh, I don't think so because in, in, you know that COPD trial, COPD patients who uh, go years together, immunomodulatory that is there. Okay, but here we are giving for that. It is not recommended. Keeping in mind, it may help, and the secondary bacterial infection and issue we can give. So why I mean to say we are using here azithromycin as an antibiotic. Let's say we are giving for a five days, as you know, in a, the upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, sometimes we go, go for the five days therapy, right? So in mild cases, as you find that there is a minimal uh, viral, uh, minimal inflammatory process. Okay. So that's why in that condition also five days uh, azithromycin will be yeah, yeah. Suppose patient is asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, you, you want to give a prophylactic antibiotic, you can add azithromycin for five days. So that is it. Dr. Shampar, will you put any opinion regarding this? Sir, azithromycin, I preferably use those who are symptomatic, means having fever, cough, or something like it. But totally asymptomatic, azithromycin has got no role, and it is not something to be mandatorily used in all patients. Yeah, yeah. very rightly told. So, based on this, you have to take a call regarding use. So, uh, and, uh, Sampath, I will ask uh, just one clarification. In the uh, ICU patient, Suppose patient has got a ADS or inflammation. Are you using injectable azithromycin? No, no, sir. No, no. So, so once the patient is in a moderate to severe, you are selecting broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, Not broad spectrum, sir. Uh, a cephalosporin, maybe a first or second generation cephalosporin is good, means in the initial days. Because uh, you need to reserve your antibiotics for any further uh, development of any serious infection like VAP or other things. So that's why we need to understand that this is a viral disease, not a bacterial disease. So antibiotics will not help you in any way. You need to uh, means take care of the patient uh, symptoms rather than just uh, putting on antibiotics. True, true. That's very uh, well taken. And uh, once you suspect a bacterial infection or you want to prevent specifically associated pneumonia, that will expand this. Uh, there is a case scenario from Dr. Kiran Kumar Pani, Pani uh, I think. Uh, the, the, uh, his uh, family, from his family only, his uh, uh, younger uh, brother was positive and now he's all right. But uh, since the day, uh, whole of my family are found uh, SPO2 99, 98 and uh, heart rate 115, 110. I think these are all uh, normal values because you are all anxious. Uh, this heart rate and saturation are there. And uh, we have many oximeters and many uh, blood pressure instruments and you are cross-checking. Don't worry, just relax. Uh, pray Lord Jagannath and uh, nothing to do. This is, there is no problem at all. The causes, causes of death, uh, sudden death in COVID-19 patients. <coughs> Dr. Shankya Das has asked, uh, causes of sudden death in COVID-19 patients, unexpected death. So, Dr. Shampad, what, what is your opinion? So, I have seen only one case uh, where uh, he was actually uh, means this Satabdi train uh, ticket collector uh, who was accompanying this uh, uh, train from Delhi. 
he was doing well but uh, suddenly in the evening he had a sudden cardiac arrest type of scenario and say x was clear everything was clear he was not on any sq or azithromycin also so my experience is that only one cases i have found that where there is a sudden death otherwise uh, if you are having sudden death means uh, mostly think about any sudden vt or uh, this uh, my myocardial infarction that could probably explain but i have seen only one case in 1000 patients so regarding this uh, sudden death patient as you know yeah, what is your one of the organ which is mostly affected with bleed so another important thing patient is having myocarditis myocarditis he will uh, develop the arrhythmia that means the one part another is uh, the thrombable so patient has got a, as a, we have already discussed microembolic macroembolism in macroembolism if there is a large thrombus that also can cause a sudden death in those patients especially when death is occurs it is due to a vascular more of the vascular cause yeah 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 so so those who have a cardiac involvement maybe myocarditis or those who have thrombolytic complications in them it may happen that Uh, because of unexplained reasons they may die we had many patients who died and uh, especially in ganjam you no know, cause was known and even transportation to the tata uh, yes. hospital people died and uh, maybe uh, they were not uh, worked out I, i think those cases are a late some cases are late cases yeah. they are already in the respiratory failure sure. and during transportation because of respiratory failure they died yeah It was already there in a desaturated state. Yeah, desaturated state right, respiratory failure. So uh, we we would not uh, uh, help them. So yesterday I give an example. One patient coming. Uh, I heard a news that uh, he has a complaint of some breathlessness. So I called him to uh, immediately send the patient to the isolation sure. before going to Ashwin uh, Hospital. You send the patient to the isolation. On the way, they have measured the saturation is 32. So I told my team, be ready, right. and whenever the patient is coming, immediately take him to the ICU. So by inter doing the intervention immediately, the patient has revived. And uh, to, uh, just uh, tomorrow, yesterday night, he is shifted to Ashwin Hospital. Yeah. So this 32 uh, saturation. Has gone to 96 saturation with a sub uh, six liter. Uh, all medicals. Sir, I want to clarify on that case. Actually, uh, this pulse oximeter can sometimes give you wrong reading if you are having any type of rigor, right? So the patient actually has started with a rigor, chills and rigor with a fever, high grade onset at home. On that, he has actually measured the saturation at home with his own pulse oximeter, which shows 36. So it was mostly because of the rigor. You sometimes get a wrong saturation reading. Uh, so by the time the patient actually reached uh, to uh, SCB, his saturation was uh, more or less ninety uh, or something. But with oxygen, he improved. Today, his saturation is hundred percent in room air, and he is doing well. <laughs> so maybe cold. Well, what I message is that if we are getting any record, be alert. Yeah, so be alert. Anything can happen in any time. So, so maybe, maybe in a cold, cami extremity, maybe a, a wrong reading, maybe because of the less peripheral circulation, he may get a wrong reading. And also, he is complaining of breathlessness. He is complaining that time in the house. He is complaining of breathlessness. So it was symptomatic also. So we have two more questions left to the panel. One is uh, how antibody tests help in a community like hostel inmates of. educational institute uh, you know antibody we are not uh, using for the diagnostic purpose it just uh, gives you a impression the of surveillance uh, process uh, uh, yeah zero survey and uh, all surveillance, surveillance process. process so if there is a group of people in the hostel you want to test you can approach uh, rmrc and uh, that will just impress that how much of community uh, common actually community in those work. cases suppose yeah. a patient is positive You have to contact tracing is important. So how many patient is there with the intimate contact with that person, and you do the test of the primary intimate contacts, then come see if they are coming as positive, then go for the secondary contacts. Right. Uh, Not, Jan, uh, can I say something? 
I think antibody test also we are doing uh, when we are giving the plasma, selecting the patient for a plasma. That is also helpful. The not antibody test, we are doing a titer. That is estimating a titer, not a uh, yeah. Uh, we are we are doing antibody titer. Yeah. Patients receiving a uh, patients uh, donating plasma, and uh, maybe uh, that helps to know whether the antibody level is adequate uh, yeah. to be of use or not. Suppose I am yeah. taking in one there is a survey by ICMR. Uh -huh. This antibody survey they found that ninety five percent there is a developing the antibody. Yeah. Now we are taking other district now also so Patak district. In some places, so there that is a surveillance study. So how many persons are uh, affected? Okay, okay. So uh, that will go to the last question. Can we use Fabipravir uh, in uh, clinical COVID? So I don't, uh, I don't think what is yes, meant by clinical COVID. COVID so, uh, yeah. Clinical COVID means uh, symptoms only. Right. Yeah. If suppose your COVID test is uh, not positive, then you cannot uh, use Fabipravir. Yeah, because uh, it has to be. I, I showed you the clinical case definition. Only when the COVID artificial uh, yeah, positive, artificial positive uh, that has to be used, and without a positive report, uh, you, you that, yeah. should not prescribe, and the patient should not take. Mm, so uh, the final words from the panel, uh, Professor Pani, what do you want to conclude with? Uh, we'll, we'll be closing in another five minutes. So, uh, you are concluding a message to the uh, CCC doctor. Or uh, the thing is that right time, you should detect right yeah. things. So, if you detect the things rightly and say, if you detect the clinical features, yes, the patient is deteriorating. And if you take the action immediately, definitely the patient will survive. And with a uh, like uh, we have to take a properly visit to the patient and we also take care of their health as well as the medicine unless and until required don't go on uh, like giving all the medicine what are the protocolized medicine we have to give and when the patient will reach for a COVID, dedicated covid hospital uh, suppose uh, uh, whatever the protocol has to be followed there and in the uh, ccc the main action of the medical officer who are there please look for these five to six uh, things whether the what is the saturation whether the patient is this neat, whether the patient is chest pain what are the joint has followed as the in his feet and if you find out that is the these are the things are there immediately try to shift to the uh, nearest patient uh, any higher center where you want to give it and where the oxygen facility is there this is my uh, sum up and about the prone position if the patient is conscious you can go for a prone position but don't pressurize the patient. You have to counsel the patient. And looking at the condition of the patient, you have to do the problem. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that uh, valuable uh, guidance. And uh, you have uh, rightly told them to utilize uh, this uh, facility. Uh, and Dr. Thatwe, you want to uh, sum up uh, your message to the uh, first-line doctors? Yeah, first-line doctors, if... Patient has come perfectly maintain the isolation and the quarantine things clearly. Second is uh, do the right thing at the right time. And triaging the patient is very important. Who is patient to be referred immediately and who is patient to be kept? That only by assessing the patient one can go for that. And oxy the simple test is the SPO2 fingertip pulse oximeter or any uh, device supplied to you. Measure the oxygen because in COVID. The first and foremost treatment, if you are going to treat the patient to save life, is oxygen. So by that, you should have very clear knowledge, oxygen, how to give, when to give, and what are the, all, not all patients will require oxygen, also not patients will require antivirals. So choose, we have discussed very adequately, choose which patient needs oxygen, which patient needs antiviral, which patient doesn't need anything, only isolation, we, we can send him to his house with good advice that's... Uh, Stay isolated, uh, take good food, good sleep, and uh, take proper things. Stay uh, isolated, more important, don't come out of your house for this, at least for two weeks or uh, two to four weeks. That is that. Thank you. Jayant, uh, can I have just one point? Jayant, can I tell you one point? No, ma'am. Tell. Uh, the most important thing is that you know, patient 
let it be a doctor let it be a, any common man the scareness is too much and that scareness has to go by proper counseling yeah whoever tell be the psychological aspect also mental health also that want to add so along with it meant the psychological support of the patient himself so uh, well taken ma'am uh, dr shampad you uh, final word to our doctors so the thing is that uh, covid treatment starts in covid care center and um, so, and give patients in in covid hospital so please maintain a proper documentation and proper referral form so that the treatment continues from one place to another it should, and it should not be a break in the treatment that we have referred means it's done that should not be the attitude sir. so uh, the process uh, the, the start, as he told uh, the uh, right uh, uh, documentation will help the whole system and as madam has uh, rightly pointed out uh, and uh, dr thapu has rightly pointed out the isolation is very important home isolation if you do a proper documentation you ask the comorbidities ask the details of the past history you can know who is fit to uh, go for home isolation and whom you should uh, send to the dedicated center directly and whom you should keep in the covid care center so uh, I, i'll de- take the opinion of uh, uh, professor mr patnaik before closing so as you know <coughs> the covid care center two group of patients are going one is a asymptomatic patient with covid positive and other and the mild symptoms so main important thing is that the uh assume the patient going to symptomatic my patient going to moderate so how will you identify that is very important one important thing is that if you do a 12 hour evaluation we can what is the recommended by the government of india that if you are assessing for patient 12 hourly then you can detect whether patient is going to be bad case or the patient is uh, required the transfer or patient could be managed with there so that is very important thing another thing don't forget to lo- uh, see for the this respiratory rate count the respiratory rate because they, uh, you told that the saturation is important and a clinical parameter another thing is the your uh, respiratory rate is important another is your heart rate is these three things look for the these three thing because we cannot examine or we are not examining the patient in the covid context so three things you give importance to the three things according to you refer the patient according to you uh, accelerate your treatment policy then we can also if at the lower level if you manage properly patient is very very uh, uh, good for the covid hospital people to prevent any complication and death threat and also more rightly sir said the uh, important thing is vital signs because a thorough examination uh, may not be safe and may not be feasible in a covid setup you should uh, see the vitals uh, very carefully uh, to know whether the patient is sinking or patient is stable uh, not to be uh, referred that's very important and uh, before we end i request uh, dr deepak to give his uh, concluding opinion thank you sir uh, so the point is i had uh, already told earlier that whoever is the ccc is managing the patient you know he or she is the first person who should decide whether the person should be uh, referred or not at the dead of the night when we decide that patient should be referred it is the onus of the doctor who is treating the patient in the ccc that he or she should decide that whether this patient is going to survive or not as a doctor whether you are ius whether you are mbbs whatever you should know that my prime responsibility is to save that patient you need to save that patient based on the whatever clinical condition that person has now so whenever you write in the group that that patient reach referral whatever you write as a doctor whether what is the oxygen saturation what is the clinical condition what are the 
comorbid condition that may deteriorate or that may hamper the clinical outcome of the patient so that's it you should know that if i am referring the case to a dch or dcsc whatever dedicated covid health center or dedicated uh, mana dedicated covid hospitals either the patient is going to be uh, survived or he is not going to survive that depends upon how you assess the case whenever that patient is last whenever you have seen that case at your ccc or whatever so whenever you refer a case you please please try to assess the what is the condition of that case so you be a doctor whenever you recommend the referral you refer as a uh, doctor you refer as per clinical conditions only don't please please don't say that the uh, parents or the persons or the uh, relatives want the person to be referred to aswini or the relatives want to be referred uh, the person to somewhere else that doesn't matter you as a clinical doctor you as a treating physician should uh, decide what should be the future course of action for that particular patient that's it i don't want to say anything more so over to you sir please thank you thank you, thank you so uh, we have taken all the questions uh, i thank uh, on behalf of hcv medical college on behalf of the training team i thank uh, Uh, or all panel, uh, Professor Amar Patnai, Professor Nivetha Pani, Dr. P K Thakur, who have joined, taken up questions. I thank uh, uh, Madam Ananya Dash, who uh, rightly started the meeting with a beautiful note uh, of uh, uh, capacity building of the first line doctors. I thank Dr. Deepak. It is a proposal from Dr. Deepak only to uh, share these facts with them, and I assure any time. uh you feel like uh, in any other topic also um, you can call them uh, to uh, share we can take up three four things uh, to issues uh, of problem oxygen therapy like uh, uh, oral antivirals like uh, any any issue they want in the management that, that we can <laughs> take up and all the uh, webinar that we are doing i'll send you the link please share among them also they can come and attend and i thank uh, dr shampad who has been a resource during uh, this covid time nobody <coughs> nobody knew that he has so much of potential he is working day and night he is doing patient care i uh, heard from professor Sh uh, dr shubhrat uh, that uh, he is uh, spending uh, whole day inside the icu only they are moving around seeing patients giving round and taking <coughs> decision and only said that why so many patients are benefited they are spending good uh, time in the uh, icu and uh, not only that he is very good in academics oratory uh, pictures and the uh, points in front are absolutely important so i thank uh, uh, the municipality corporation i thank department of health and family welfare and i thank all the panels i thank the speakers i thank all the delegates for joining and with that we end and uh, i welcome you all for all the uh, series of webinars which will be taking place till the pandemic is over thank you thank you everyone uh, thank you sir on behalf of uh, municipality corporation i thank dr panda dr patnaik dr pani dr thatoi and all the people who are involved in this uh, training and uh, i will uh, require more help from all the people who are there uh, because in this pandemic situation we require all the technical people to come uh, around and to uh, train all the people who are on the field actually who are fighting the covid and uh, we are indebted to all the people who are there in the sc medical college and the training center on the telemedicine center who are helping everybody uh, to build the capacity so thank you sir thank you for the join sir thank you mr patnaik sir thank you nivedha madam thank you thatoi sir everybody and all the administrative officials uh, be it with the commissioner all the all the secretaries deputy secretaries who are involved in this program thank you thank you a lot thank you sir thank you deepak with this uh, we are ending the program thank you
ちょっと待って。<音声><音声><音声><音声><音声> Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. 